peptides are only gaining more interest. And I want to make sure that I am doing videos that really lay it out with an educational foundation, not condoning, not endorsing, telling you to, hey, go talk to a doctor if this is something of interest, but more so laying out some of the research and understanding that when today we're talking about like muscle building and fat burning and recovery peptides like ipamorelin and CJC1295, most of the research is still in rodents. There are some human studies with these peptides compared to some of the other ones, but we still have to understand that these things are new and that comes with its own risk and I wanna make sure that I put that disclosure out there. Okay, it's really important. So we're talking about GHRPs, growth hormone releasing peptides. What these things do is they stimulate the natural pulsing, the pulsatility of growth hormone compared to say like flooding your body with an exogenous growth hormone, like human growth hormone. You're taking a, something that's a peptide that's naturally occurring in your body and you're stimulating the natural production. So we'll talk about how that works. We'll talk about what it does from a fat burning perspective, from a muscle building perspective, recovery, IGF, all that. We'll go soup to nuts and understand even drawbacks that we've seen in some of the literature as well. And after today's video, I popped a link down below for 25% off Seeds Daily Symbiotic. Look, I experiment on myself. You know that about me. I experiment with peptides. I experiment with things. I am a guinea pig and that's what this channel is about. But when it comes down to the gut health, I really focus on that. And seed has probably been the most powerful thing that I have done for my gut health, independent of actually changing my diet. So they utilize a capsule inside of a capsule, super cool technology, and that's a 25% off discount link. Look, I do not promote probiotics much on this channel. The only probiotic that I promote is seed because it's the only one that I really think has the strong clinical data behind it to really reinforce it because most probiotics end up getting destroyed by the gut by the time you consume them. And I'm telling you, I notice a significant change. Some other members of my family have noticed a significant change and friends of mine have noticed a significant change. So that link is down below. Top line in the description is 25% off. You're not gonna find that discount link many other places. So top line underneath this video. So first, a little bit of groundwork on GHRPs. So growth hormone releasing peptides, specifically in this case, once again, CJC1295 and ipamorelin. What they actually do is mimic ghrelin binding receptor activity within the pituitary and the hypothalamus. Ghrelin is the hunger hormone. You might be wondering like, what does ghrelin have to do with this? Ghrelin, believe it or not, actually influences growth hormone release. And not saying that you need to go out and be hungry all the time to stimulate growth hormone, but there is some actual evidence there. Like we've even seen it in some of the like rodent model fasting studies, like when they actually increase ghrelin, it does increase hormone or growth hormone pulsatility. But that's not what we're really focusing on here. So what makes a growth hormone releasing peptide like ipamorelin or CJC potentially more advantageous is that you're not having this bombardment with an exogenous hormone that would shut down natural endogenous production. That's really important. So you're essentially releasing growth hormone in its natural pulsatile like fashion, right? It's normal pulses. And this is really good when it comes down to tissue repair, when it comes down to metabolic health, when it comes down to just recovery, skin, all these things are really important. That's why we secrete growth hormone, okay? So let's start with a study that was highlighting something that's really important from sort of a natural pulsatility side of things first. It was looking at CJC1295 peptide specifically. This study was published in the journal Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. And what they found is that when given CJC, their growth hormone did increase, but it increased in the same natural pulsatile fashion as it did in placebo, just with more, right? So it maintained that same pulsatile fashion, that same regularity. Again, so important because it allows for all the downstream things and the hormonal changes that come as a result of increases to take effect without just like blindsiding your body with one massive type of in, in exogenous thing, right? The other thing you have to look at is with things like ipamorella and things like CJC, you're not having an increase in cortisol or an increase in prolactin. This is something that's pretty common if you're using exogenous human growth hormone. The other side of the equation is peptides are generally much more affordable. So as we get into the interesting sort of world of this, as we're seeing more experts and more scientists and doctors kind of using these things, it might be more affordable for those that are in need of it. Again, this video is for educational purposes only. I'm not endorsing, I'm not condoning. I will personally say that I have used CJC and ipamorelin and my recovery has been phenomenal with it. But again, I'm just experimenting on myself. Now from a fat loss perspective, 
these are really interesting peptides, okay? Because growth hormone plays a pretty critical role when it comes down to fat loss. But specifically, growth hormone is really good at increasing lipolysis. Like it's a key driver for lipolysis. Now, where do growth hormone releasing peptides come into play? Well, first we have to make sure that GHRPs like ipamorelin and CJC actually do increase growth hormone. So let's look at one study. This study was published in the European Journal of Endocrinology. It was done in rats and it was using ipamorelin in this case. The other study was using CJC. So with ipamorelin, they found that there was almost as much growth hormone release as a direct growth hormone receptor sort of agonist would do, like a GHRP6, a really strong one that isn't usually used otherwise. So basically, there was a huge increase in growth hormone. Now, we'll talk more about what that looks like later on in this video, but I wanted to get that simple study out in the open. So now, how about from a fat loss perspective? What is actually happening? Well, there's a study published in the European Journal of Applied Physiology that looked at growth hormone's effect on BMR, like basal metabolic rate and overall uh, thermic energy expenditure. So in this particular case, they found that growth hormone releasing peptides could increase BMR and thermic energy expenditure by five and 7% respectively, which means we're having an increase in just our basal metabolic rate and our just energy expenditure from heat, five and 7%. Since we know that growth hormone is a key driver of lipolysis, we can elucidate that most of this increase in metabolic rate is probably promoting strong fat loss. It's probably coming from fat oxidation and just general lipolysis, simply because growth hormone drives these things up. It stimulates lipolysis by actually activating hormone-sensitive lipase more. So you're using more fat as a fuel source. So five and 7% just on basic basal metabolic rate is pretty darn impressive. Now I'll tell you the reason that I personally wanted to use ipamorelin was to improve sleep. You see, personally, I'm in a caloric deficit a lot, which can disturb your sleep. It can disturb your deep sleep. There's some interesting evidence on growth hormone releasing peptides in rodents, but also some other evidence uh, mechanistically to understand how it's doing it. There's some interesting evidence in humans on growth hormone releasing peptides, like seeing how it influences sleep. So there was a study that was published in Neuroendocrinology. This is interesting because they gave subjects growth hormone releasing peptide or placebo. And what they found is that those that had the growth hormone releasing peptide within you, the first day had a 25 minute increase in stage two sleep compared to placebo. Now what's interesting is stage two sleep is not the slow wave sleep. Most people wouldn't think that that would be that much of a benefit. A 25 minute increase in stage two is not deep sleep. Growth hormone is released in deep sleep. So why would this matter? What's interesting is that stage two sleep actually sets the stage for growth hormone release in slow wave sleep. It relaxes the body. So if you have shorter stage two sleep, you're not gonna pulse as much growth hormone and you're not gonna get as good of a deep sleep. So it's actually quite important that you have this increase in the stage two sleep. Not to mention stage two sleep can also improve your hunger because this is where you kind of abate some of the ghrelin that would normally cause hunger throughout the day. So stage two sleep is really good for healthy metabolism and setting the stage for growth hormone release. But then we look at another study that was really interesting. And this one was more of a mechanistic study looking at the brain and how it responded, in this case with rats, to growth hormone releasing peptides. So it was published in Journal Physiology. They found that growth hormone releasing peptides in this case did increase slow wave sleep, probably because it was a little bit longer term and easier to look at this way. But they found that it increased GABAergic activity in the preoptic area of the brain. GABAergic activity, GABA is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter, which means it shuts down excitatory functions, it calms you. So when GABA is influenced in this particular way, we have sort of a stopping of the wake promoting actions in the brain. We have all kinds of things that will promote wakefulness in the brain while we're sleeping that are happening unbeknownst to us. You know, things that go bump in the night will wake us up, sure. But there's things that are happening in our body that'll trigger us to wake up. These are called wake promoting events. So the more GABAergic that you are, the more GABA tilted you are, the more calm you're gonna be and the less you will have of these waking events we have to remember that sleep is key. So even if it's just something that's improving sleep, that's where there's some promise with CJC and ipamorelin and other growth, horm growth hormone releasing peptides. But let's talk about recovery. Let's talk about strength and possibly even some hypertrophy here. There was a study published in the journal Clinical Endocrinology Metabolism that was again looking at CJC 1295. In this case, they found a two to 10 X increase in growth hormone. Now that sounds like a lot and it is above natural, but 
make no mistake, like if you're using an exogenous growth hormone, it's going to be significantly more than that. Like regular growth hormone, yes, obviously that's going to be huge, but it comes with all these other downsides. A 2 to 10x increase is pretty wild, but there's also a 1.5 to 3x increase in IGF, insulin-like growth factor, which is so important when it comes down to muscle recovery. So we'll talk about what that looks like. See, growth hormone is really good for metabolic repair, for general muscle repair, connective tissue, skin repair, uh, damaged tissue, things like that. Growth hormone is good for that. IGF is a little more specific in this case to muscle. Like it's good for muscle growth, muscle protein synthesis. It's also good for the stimulation of satellite cells, which are muscle stem cells. So huge evidence even indirectly, like if you're increasing IGF, you're gonna increase the potential to build muscle. But what's interesting is that that one and a half to three X increase of IGF ended up lasting for 28 days with no adverse outcomes, no adverse situations there. So it seemed to be pretty safe, at least in the context of this study. I want to talk downsides for just a second before I pivot over to the actual strength and muscle building piece, okay? The biggest downside that you could potentially face with this is when you increase something like IGF, you increase the growth of other things, right? You increase the growth, of course, muscle and tissue repair, but also some not so good things that I'm not going to talk about on YouTube because even the word could flag this video. But the thing is, is that it can trigger the growth of some things that we definitely don't want, okay? And that is why I say with such unbelievable caution, like you should talk to a professional. Don't just take my word for it. I am at the end of the day, a guy on YouTube and I'm educating and I'm using science and I'm using legit literature here, but talk to a professional, talk to someone that really knows this stuff, because this is something you could talk to a doctor about and they could use it with you, but don't do it just because you're listening to me. Talk to them and just use me as like a, a gateway to learn about this, right? The other thing that we have to understand is since it is a ghrelin sort of agonist, it can make you hungry. It acts like ghrelin, so it can make you hungry. So if fat loss is your goal, just be aware that sugar cravings and all these things can happen with this, okay? So you just need to be very cautious of that. The interesting thing is there's not a lot of strength studies out there with growth hormone releasing peptides, but there is one with ipamorelin that was published in GH and IGF research, which is interesting. It was a rodent study, and they found that it basically increased, ipamorelin increased the titanic tension, like sort of the ability for the peak muscle contraction of a muscle, meaning we actually could get stronger when a muscle is being used at its maximum intensity, which it's hard to tell because you can't directly take a rodent model. Like, I don't know how they test that. I would imagine it's pretty gnarly. They probably test it until like the muscle like snaps or the, they can't hold it anymore. So maybe not the best thing and it's not something that we would expose ourselves to as humans, but it still makes some sense that it would increase sort of the ability to handle peak contraction or peak strength. But from a hypertrophy perspective, there is an interesting study. It was published in PLOS1. This one was done on yaks, kind of interesting. In this case, they gave them growth hormone releasing peptides and there was an increase in the actual myofiber diameter. So the, the actual myofibril actually increased in size and they weren't lifting weights. I mean, they're just carrying their own weight. So the growth hormone triggered a release, like, or, or that growth hormone triggered a, a response where the muscle grew and there was an increase in myofiber diameter and total muscle, uh, skeletal muscle area. So the actual like cross-sectional area of a muscle increased. So they legitimately built muscle. Not to mention they had an increase in growth hormone and they had an increase in IGF, which is of course to be expected. But one of the things I found the most interesting is that they had a decrease in the mRNA that's associated with atrophy. So what that means is there is an increase in muscle protein synthesis, but simultaneously there is a decrease in muscle atrophy. And building muscle is all about that balance between muscle protein synthesis and muscle protein breakdown. So not only are we increasing MPS and building, but we're stopping catabolism and breakdown. So this makes it very unique in the use case of like maintaining muscle. And maybe we're gonna start seeing some more of this like being used in cases uh, for people that are sick, people that need to maintain their muscle for good metabolic health or maintain their muscle when they're dealing with something really bad, right? Uh, maybe even post-injury. We might start seeing a lot more of this. At the end of the day, this is just a YouTube channel. This is purely educational, although it's very interesting stuff that we probably should look more at. But keep an ear to the ground for new research that comes out so you can always keep a keen eye to the safety and whatnot. As always, I'll see you tomorrow.